All right, now I can turn my mic on. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Happy New Year. It's been a while. Uh, we'll go ahead and start off tonight's 12th and City Council work session for Monday, January 13th with a discussion of regional land use and transportation update. Good evening. Karen Aquila, welcome. Yes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Aquila Hurd Ravich with the Community Development Department, and I'd like to reintroduce to you Garrett Pryor, who is now our policy analyst. Um, mm. In the last couple of months, he's went from a management analyst to a policy analyst, and we're uh, as excited about it as he is because it gives us some more capacity um, to do some more things and um, in the transportation world and other policy related. Um, worlds, <laughs> mm -hmm. housing, economic development, transportation, yeah, all of these. I'm <laughs> picturing like, you know, multiple Venn diagrams mm -hmm. <laughs> floating around, yeah. so. And teleportation is invented, so I'm able yeah. to jump between yeah. these worlds. Yeah, right. And, and cloning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And cloning, yeah. Yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, and I just want to thank uh, Quilla and Sherilyn, and, and being able to advance and grow within an organization is something I, I, I greatly wanted to do. Uh, this has just been an excellent landing spot here close to home, and, and I think I found a real sweet spot as far as uh, being able to work on these issues, so thank you. All right, so our quarter four update. We'll be traveling back to the year 2019 uh, and kind of ending us out there. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so again, the purpose for uh, these quarterly updates are to highlight some of the top projects uh, that are receiving public input, um, to talk about kind of uh, comments or, or get direction from you all as far as what, do we, what, what should be Tualatin's voice, what are some questions we want here. Um, and then as you're at different meetings and you look down in the active and less active list kind of that, that are in the staff report, um, just kind of having a quick background or knowledge or wondering like, well, what could this impact to Tualatin be? So that, that's, that's kind of our third purpose. So our first project here to talk about is the Southwest Corridor Plan. Uh, it's uh, mainly headed there by TriMet and it's connecting um, 12 miles of light rail between Portland and the Bridgeport Transit Center here in Tualatin. So let's go to our handy dandy transportation map. Uh, so again, as you can see, this is uh, mainly kind of a, a, a regionally led project, uh, but it really, it touches all levels of government from the state all the way down here uh, or up here to uh, us in the city of Tualatin. So although the project started and ended in the same location, <laughs> it has been uh, quite a journey this past year. Uh, and uh, Councilor Kellogg said from the very beginning, don't stop believing, Garrett, hold on to the feeling. So I didn't know what feeling he was talking about, but uh, that was very close to it. But, um, uh, but really, it has been, uh, I would say, even a couple of comments. I, I think it was uh, Councilor Dirksen at the last steering committee um, said that the, this project to Tualatin, uh, I think you've used the words in peril, you know, sometimes throughout the year. And as you'll see in my quick recap here, it really has been uh, a, a, a fight at times or a coordination from you all here on council, from Councillor Kellogg putting in many hours. So I just want to thank you all, thank Councillor Kellogg and those uh, like Linda Ballholt, Susan Nowak, Angela Hendren, uh, those in the community as well that have spoken up and, and advocated for Tualatin. Yeah. We owe a great deal of gratitude to uh, Washington County. Yeah. They were the ones who were putting the leverage to get the project to be involved. Mm -hmm. so definitely. Yeah. So that be yeah. Oh, definitely agree. And so uh, the next two slides I actually want to uh, use quickly as an example of how these meetings help impact the process. So this slide was in the quarter two presentation of last year. Um, and so at the time, there was uh, 360 million or so, somewhere right around there, gap to get to uh, Tualatin. And so it's, it's, we really started off the year uh, with this new cost estimate, and it showed that we're going to have a lot of ground to make up to get here uh, in, into, into the connection. Um, we also, as staff, hearing kind of your comments and the comments of the community, drafted up a few uh, like very specific negotiation points that we wanted to see into the project. We brought that before you. You said, yes, we really like those points. You added a little bit to it. 
Um, and I'll say over the year, everything you see that's in bold up on the screen, we successfully advocated for or are very close to getting that secured within the project. And so I just want to say that this is uh, this forum that we set up here, this kind of back and forth and your comments, I think this is a really good example of how this works best. Um, so there's times where you, got, you all give us general things and we come back with specific, but getting, giving us direction is, is very helpful. So uh, oh, it's God. summertime, and, uh, and with a new cost <laughs> estimate, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and Aquila said this one, you know, Tualatin works hard for our money, so you better treat us right. And, and okay. um, the, the cost estimate, so, so Councilor Kellogg and the steering committee had worked on that $360 million question, dropped it down to $260 million. One of those big sacrifices was giving up the above grade uh, uh, rail at Upper Boone's Ferry. Um, but then when the numbers were rerun in the summer, the cost gap went from 260 ballooned up to 460 million so we were not we were actually in a worse position than we were starting the year uh in in july and so that's where really you saw the this is kind of their scoring uh funding card and you needed to check literally every one of these boxes to get to tualatin so not only were additional cuts made to the project uh to get here uh, but m new money uh, in, in TriMet's estimation from the federal government, uh, new money from what's going to be proposed in the, uh, the, the transportation bond through Metro, um, and then uh, money from the state uh, for, uh, for around the Barber Boulevard area uh, was included in that. And so we get to December's meeting, and uh, the next two slides are really the main uh, a real key point in the project as far as uh, denoting that the project will go to Tualatin. There's still a $93 million funding gap, uh, but it's going to go to Tualatin um, and they're going to continue to work on finding those extra dollars to close the gap. And then there, there was a lot of discussion around this, but it ended up, uh, which I think is very helpful language for Tualatin. Um, that the line will serve the most riders and reduce the most vehicles miles traveled, which are very helpful words as far as getting to 12th in there. Um, and that uh, Upper Boone's Ferry, which is re really, it's kind of as far down as you can get uh, without going to 12th and is going to be identified in what the feds require be identified as a minimum operable segment. And so uh, for this next year, kind of the two major documents that you're going to see are the uh, final in environmental impact study. And this really talks about uh, the bare basics of the project, what will the project uh, construct, and, and that will be released um, uh, a kind of late spring time frame. And then uh, coming before you in February uh, at your, I believe your second city council meeting uh, at a work session like this will be TriMet on the conceptual design report. Um, and I think what's really key on that is we can provide them feedback at that time, and then there'll also be an open house in at uh, Twalton Elementary in March for people to give feedback on uh, not just kind of the nuts and bolts of the project, but what's the look and the feel, how are buses going to connect to this, how are people going to connect to this to really realize the goals of that. And so I'd really like to, uh, we can think of some stuff tonight, but kind of gear your minds up for when TriMet comes in next month to really provide them input on those items. Because, for example, here's the park and ride uh, that's at Park Avenue in Milwaukee. There were some sentences, just few sentences, in the conceptual design report for the orange line, and those sentences turned into this architecture and this landscaping and the trails uh, that all connected this station to the neighborhood. TriMet worked for a few years leading up to it with the neighborhood groups and associations, and a lot of that stemmed from language that was in the conceptual design report. So this is a key document uh, in the process of this project. And then the final thing I just wanted to point out is that Tualatin is on the map now. So TriMet's maps for, for the longest time, and I, I picked this up uh, a few months ago when they were putting out the future station maps, didn't include Tualatin. We now have Tualatin on there, so whenever you see TriMet putting out their new future maps, uh, we're on it. So I thought that was fun. Exactly. Thank you. There's no song for that. Uh, oh, I should have we're on that. I don't have an on the map song. So. I'll, uh, I think they worked that out in programming, but yeah, theoretically it would be, yeah. I think they might give it a new color, though. 
And so, um, again, uh, uh, just uh, on the commu uh, community advisory committee, Angela Handren, she's a renter here, works at Portland State University. She's been showing up to a lot of these meetings, putting in hours as well, reviewing the project. So great thank you to her. TriMet's presentation is coming up next month. And um, just wanted to kind of open it up for any questions, comments, thoughts from you all as far as the next steps um, in this process. Comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Uh, especially, I want to congratulate you and thank you for all the work you've done on this. You've been instrumental in keeping me informed, uh, and you and Aquila going to all the technical meetings, and you guys are an encyclopedia of knowledge on this project, and it's extremely helpful. So thank you. Uh, the two items that I wanted to talk about that we have eh, unwritten but in process uh, with TriMet are the size of the parking garage at the Bridgeport Transit Center, which we've spoken about in the past. Uh, and then a series of pedestrian improvements at 72nd, which we also talked about, uh, given the number of people who are going to get off this train and walk over to Bridgeport Village and other points west. Um, those are really my two largest outstanding concerns are the parking and the pedestrian safety. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of managing the traffic flow that's going to be coming in and out of here, particularly the buses uh, at rush hour times. Um, so there's a lot of work left to be done. Uh, but I couldn't be happier with uh, the result we've gotten our first year on the Southwest <laughs> uh, Corridor Committee. Um, it's been in very uh, informational in terms of learning how to work with other jurisdictions uh, and thinking broader uh, on a regional project because, you know, it's nice to have this stop in Tualatin for Tualatin, but really it's more of a regional <coughs> importance. Uh, people are going to be coming uh, as a funnel from points south and points west uh, to grab the train at Bridgeport. Uh, and we need to accommodate those folks as well as continue to get uh, our transportation moving smoothly. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> other comments, Paul. <coughs> so don't forget me. I was also attending every oh, meeting, yeah. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> Councillor Kellogg being really sick one time, and um, it was the meeting where the mayor of Tiger decided to. Um, it was a very exciting meeting. Yeah. Uh, I just have one question. First off, thank all the hard work you guys have done. It's just it's, to watch that process, just to go through the entire process, has just been um, a fascinating study of you know Alice in Wonderland <laughs> down the rabbit hole and back up again. Um, but my, the only question I have is, well, I have, I have two, two questions. The first one is, you mentioned a hearing at Twalton Elementary in March. Do you have the date for that? Um, I don't, but I'll, I'll send it out, and I'll make sure when they're here next month that we get that. Yeah, cause I, I, I'd yeah. really like to have that on my calendar. Um, and, and the second thing is I know they're just now getting involved with the funding, but I heard a very interesting comment. This is third hand, so I take it for what it's worth, but apparently there are some Metro councilors now that are in favor of abandoning the project. And I, for whatever that's worth, um, I mean, something to be thinking about as we move forward because uh, the cost has gone through the roof and there doesn't appear to be a really good way to pay for it without the help from the state and the federal government. And the federal government's not governing right now, and the state uh, isn't coming forth with any money. And so it's a huge problem uh, for President Peterson and, and, and the rest of the group. And I know they're having a meeting tonight. But I saw your letter. Mayor was very well. Did you write that? It was very good. Um, to at least be included, you know, to get <laughs> those projects included, the 99 in particular, uh, the, uh, I think the mayor made a very good point about you know the region and how that affects that roadway affects the region. And the other thing I would add to that is I don't think anyone's looked at that road in 50 years. Mm -hmm. So that was all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Other comments? <coughs> Just thank you for all your hard work on this. It's very exciting. Yeah. First, congratulations on your new role. Obviously. You're pretty happy about it, just going down the road, so to speak. Um, I, um, I'm not going to be able to be at that city council meeting. So um, the one where they're going to be doing the feedback comments, the second mm -hmm. city council meeting February. in February. So um, just like the suggestion I had um, before about having us um, sign on to the letter, I, if there are suggestions ahead of time that get emailed to me that um, I can weigh in on, I'd be happy to um, show my support that way. Thank you. Okay. The comments? 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you for everything you did at Quill and Garrett, and especially Councillor Kellogg. He and I were in a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails. All four of us were <laughs> talking email all the time, as well as, uh, as Councillor Kellogg said, in discussions with uh, Commissioner Rogers a lot. Uh, it was a team effort uh, just to keep beating on them to get it to Bridgeport. They finally listened, but thanks for all that. Um, we got to keep at it because now phase two with tier two corridors, all stuff outside of Southwest Corridor, I know you're going to get to. We got to keep beating the drum on that. The, you mentioned about buses. So in my discussions with TriMet, they were super cagey about talking about bus service at this time. How far in the weeds, you mentioned that they're going to get into it, but are they going to get to any route discussions yet, or that's too early? The, about, <laughs> they'll be more specific about route discussions uh, two to one year before the project, but there were assumptions on how buses would be rerouted. In It'll be published in this final environmental impact study. So we'll kind of know what TriMet's thinking as far as improvement there, and we'll kind of dig down into those technical details. I know Washington County is very interested in mm -hmm. it as well to just bring out uh, what are those assumptions and if that's the plan, what do we need to know? Is that a good plan or not? And, and can we uh, start on some of that advocacy work now and not wait until 2025 right. type thing? Because my, my concern yeah. with the bus routes is, one, I heard that they would, one of the things they were thinking about is decreasing the amount of 96 buses. Mm -hmm. Once light rail opens up, they decrease that service. Two was expansion of service down Borland Road, the Oregon City plan we want to get you know done. That bus goes from here to Oregon City down Borland. And then I think Robert and I also talked about with TriMet, how are you going to get some kind of the buses, like a hub and spoke system here, that we don't have to have the folks driving actually to the Bridgeport uh, station to park. Somehow the buses can route them here, some kind of shuttle service. If we deploy park and rides around the area on 99W, stuff like that. Um, in addition to, you know, new routes, possibly that those are the kind of things I want to talk about. Maybe it's a little too early, um, because I think if we can get the people to stay out of town, we don't have to deal with the congestion. That's what we want. So something out of town that we get shuttles in, get the vets, get to all the services that we have on Borland road right now, especially at Rolling Hills church There's three different, uh, um, agencies or three, three kinds of service coming out of. Rolling Hills Church right now that people can't get to. And then, you know, down the road, eventually we all know something's going to happen in Stafford, so TriMet needs to address that. You know, that's coming down the pike that Stafford has to be dealt with and Borland Road. And then, you know, impacts the service if people are, you know, I've heard people say 96 runs great, and they bet that the 96 bus will still be faster than the light rail. So I hate to see a decrease in service on 96 and some of the express stuff. Um, but I guess we'll learn that more about that in February. Um, those are the details I'm worried about. It's, sure, you know, sure. Trying to keep the cars as much as possible out of town and then getting that that south, you know, the route down Borland and, uh, you know, expanding bus service as much as we can in areas we don't have it yet. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, two thoughts on that quickly. One, sure. the, we'll get to it in our third update, but um, the TriMet Service Enhancement Plan, that's where we really want to land these improvements, especially in the bus network. And then the other thing I saw that's very encouraging, ODOT and TriMet are looking at bus on shoulder on the highways. Uh, it's similar in Washington, Washington when the, yeah. during rush hour, mm -hmm. uh, the buses can run on right. the emergency lanes right. and they keep tow trucks at the exits in case there's an emergency to swoop in and do that. Okay. So that's the first time that's been looked at at the state it's going on now. And uh, I know the Tualatin to Wilsonville and Tualatin to uh, Oregon City were two of their like if they're going to start out like a very high part of the list. So, right. yeah. Thank you. Definitely. I know you got more to go. Yep. All right. <laughs> cool. Let's go right All right. Uh, Highway 99W, which uh, Councillor Morrison talked a little bit about there in, in kind of the, the future of this, but um, it's a joint effort. ODOT, Washington County, Tigard, Sherwood, King City, and Tualatin. And so, um, ODOT owns the road, so they're kind of the, the project lead on this. They put $50,000 to begin an early look study into developing a larger, kind of more comprehensive study of the corridor. Um, and, it, and it really it touches on the county and then local jurisdictions, but also uh, key uh, funding documents and plans that you see there in the middle of the page. Uh, those are all going to be impacted possibly by, by what goes on here. 
Um, and so I talked about those uh, early looks uh, that are going on. Nelson Nygaard is the consultant. And um, really, they want to identify what's, what's the problem to better understand the size and scale of a larger study. And so I, I jumped this page up real quickly. I want to talk about who we talked to, and then I'll say what they, what they had to say. Uh, but visited 10 uh, and called seven businesses or neighborhoods in the area, um, social media posts, flyers, handed out interviews um, directly with representatives from the Aging Task Force, River Park CIO, um, and then kind of a, a kind of interdepartmental staff meeting as well. Um, and it was really great when folks wrote back in their responses that are included on the staff report. Each one of them accessed kind of the question in a different way. People <coughs> saw it on Facebook or I visited at their office or they received a flyer. And so that was excellent to see. Um, and so this was the, the flyer that got sent out. Uh, really some of the main takeaways from that. Uh, very dangerous intersection at Romer's Rest RV. Uh, that's where a lot of U-turns had to be made for larger or commercial vehicles there. Uh, multiple businesses pointed that out, not just the Romer's Rest folks. Um, environmental uh, uh, improvement, safety improvements, especially for pedestrian and bicycles. Uh, and, and really, it's, the conflict is this kind of how do we balance the local needs, people who live and work there, with these regional needs of folks who want to get to the beach or Honestly, in, in the, a couple of the businesses I talked to, there are people li who live in Portland are commuting down here. Uh, so really, that represents that, e that equally reverse commute shed where 48,000 people come from here, go up to Portland, and the same are, are, are doing it the other way. And so um, uh, the, this Wednesday, uh, the task force, well, tonight, uh, the Metro Council has a public hearing on their Tier 1 corridors and the investment within there. The Southwest Corridor Plan is our main uh, uh, item in that list. Um, Megan George from the city has went to take some notes. We submitted, uh, the mayor submitted a letter there for their public comment. On Wednesday, the task force will talk more about the revenue um, options for the, the ballot measure. And then, uh, and then at their February meeting, February, March, April are all going to be about tier two corridors. So this is an important time to have our voices be heard about investment uh, in the 99W project or in the Twalton area in general. So open this up for any feedback on those next steps or if there were things in the public comments or others uh, for this project that um, sparked any interest. Comments? <clears throat> Just two things. <clears throat> Got some. Okay. Uh, Garrett and I are going to Salem tomorrow on uh, behalf of a lobbying effort for uh, a million dollar ask from the legislature for funding for the study. And that's in addition to the five million we're trying to get from uh, Metro for the, as a tier two corridor. And the consultants also met with the five mayors. We had lunch. Uh, few weeks goes a blur right now in December with the five mayors we have meetings every couple months with the five it's uh, myself Tigard uh, here we go Tigard Tualatin uh, King City Durham and who am I missing Sherwood, Sherwood uh, meet and uh, have informal lunch talk about strategy and stuff like that <coughs> they came and spent about 45 minutes with us at lunch to discuss what we wanted to see from the study and what needs to be done with 99W and they got quite a, I think they got a lot of information, they were writing like crazy. So we'll see what they, see how they distill that down to all of us ranting <laughs> at lunch. Valerie. I just wanted to kind of reiterate your point with, uh, it, it's not only a, a main driving corridor, it's, it's a bike route for not only, and pedestrian for local. Mm -hmm. I've been on that road, it's kind of sketchy. Mm -hmm. And um, it also like, it's like after Tigard Barber becomes like a main corridor into Portland. So mm -hmm. it'd be really great if that really was a really nice, safe bike way mm -hmm. into Portland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. And eventually you're, you're going to have a regional trail crossing 99W <coughs> at one point. Mm -hmm. And then you're also going to have, I mean, they're trying to build up, it is a popular spot, but building up more tourism for the uh, bird sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, we'll keep you uh, updated on that, and as these uh, opportunities for public comment come up, we'll, we'll let you all know and let the community know. All 
a third major project here is the uh, different shuttle studies going on. So one uh, through Ride Connection and one through Clackamas County. These are both funded by the, uh, I believe it's the 0.1% payroll tax that was passed with the uh, 2017 uh, legislature. And so uh, again, this is kind of a county level uh, uh, designations and then also to some of the transit providers, Smart and Ride Connection that work throughout the region. So here's Ride Connection. Uh, if you haven't met these folks, they're excellent folks. Not only do they run a couple of fixed uh, shuttles throughout the community, they do demand response and they do, I think, what's really needed in a lot of this. Uh, if it's your first time and you're a little unsure about riding a shuttle or the bus, they'll come and meet with you and kind of walk you through it uh, and, and all that. And so um, I think uh, there hasn't been a lot of funding sources for this. And so these new state dollars, I think, will be a real support uh, to their efforts. And so uh, their community engagement, uh, I didn't, again, get a specific website that they'll set up, but they said that's going to start here in uh, early 2020. Um, they're really, they have money to do either more hours or go to different locations or kind of expand the service uh, that's here. Um, uh, they'll be at the Aging Task Force on February 10th at 3 p.m. And then uh, John Whitman at Ride Connection is their main, uh, main contact for the project there if you want to give input into that. The other, and this is, a, this is a really key, one of these key pieces of paper that drives a lot of what TriMet does, but they have service enhancement plans uh, for all the areas. And so the shaded uh, kind of orange and yellow that you see on the screen there, that's this connection between Tualatin, West Lynn, and Oregon City that's long been desired in this community, connect over to the Veterans Hospital, to the other resources that are along the road. Um, I met with the, the Rolling Hills, uh, I'll call them the Rolling Hills group, so that's the Borland Free Clinic, the Schoolhouse Pantry, uh, the other kind of meals for people experiencing homelessness and that kind of services that they provide. Um, and so they're connected into and very interested in this project as well. Yep. So Clackamas County uh, got money to do a couple of different uh, shuttle-based projects, so they're going to hire one consultant to do all of that. Um, and then uh, written into it will be that uh, materials will be bilingual and they very much want to work with the cities um, and other places to, uh, to do that kind of engagement into the process and uh, really identify those needs. So that'll be uh, more so in the spring. Um, I'm the contact for that now if people are interested. And as they develop a website and do all that type of stuff, we'll be pushing that out uh, through um, our communication channels. And so tonight, if there were any specifics, whether it's with the ride connection or uh, Clackamas County shuttle uh, that you wanted us to address or try to get into these projects or people you wanted to connect with us to, we just wanted to uh, provide that opportunity tonight. Thank you. That it? Mm -hmm. Any comments from that? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I just... Um... Also, when we're talking about different people that would use that, um, the people that come in here to work, workers from that live in Oregon City in those areas, mm -hmm. I think that's a really important demographic of people to include as yeah. far as people that would be utilizing that. So thank you very much. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and we'll try to connect with, like, with Legacy Meridian and yeah. see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know uh, the third entity out there, Rolling Hills, is Family Promise, and they're mm -hmm. very interested mm -hmm. right. in service being out there also for the folks who are trying to go out to work during the day. Definitely. I just, if I may, I mean, that's a, oh, oh, no, that's oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump I just in. had like one. <laughs> <laughs> My question was, is there any cost to do ride share, or how, how does that work? Um, they, is there a website? So mm -hmm. I can promote it just Sure. Um, <coughs> the Westside Transportation Alliance, so, and I can send this website out for mm -hmm. all that. They, they kind of uh, collect all the different, what are the resources that are in place now? If somebody needs to ride share or shuttle or van or kind of, uh, uh, there are, there's a requirement even for some employers to provide options within the company 
uh, to do this. If you have so many people at your job site, it's actually in, uh, in Department of Environmental Quality. Mm -hmm. So I'll send that link out. They, they do a good job of packaging those resources. But Ride Connection does have a, a, a website. website. Oh, yeah. It, it's just uh, rideconnection.com. And I believe that it's free. It's free. Within the city. Mm -hmm. Or just oh, okay. wherever they operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I guess I was just <clears throat> um, very over, not overwhelmed, but there's an immense amount of things going on right now, and I just can't tell you how reassuring it is to see that we have a seat at the table in all of these different processes and that you've done such a great job to advocate for us and the counselors that are on the different commissions i just think it's fantastic and that i mean that is a lot of projects with a lot of stakeholders and a lot of meetings and i just think that we are so on top of things and we just really have a voice in the planning and what the future of the community can look like and i'm just so gratified that we're in that position i just think it's fantastic and big accolades to everybody involved yeah, because that's you. that's no small thing <laughs> yeah. you know and it's very pivotal important planning stuff for our whole community's future so I feel good about that now so thank you cool thank you oh there's more um, there's more, more. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, so we went to uh, uh, went to a few town halls covered uh, with a representative Prusak brought together. This is from the Westland Town Hall, the picture you see on the screen. But uh, really, to uh, uh, Council President Grimes' point of there is a lot going on, um, and it's not just you know us who's uh, finding a hard time communicating that. What I took away from both of these events was just the enormity that that even just in the public and how can I connect into these things? What is government doing for me? Is are they solving this transportation problem? And the answer is yes, but in a bunch of different ways. And it's, sometimes it's hard to connect into all those different pieces. So uh, uh, the takeaways, and, and kind of that's the, the bottom bullet point that I just explained there. Uh, but the others, especially here in Tualatin, was the idea around transportation and the environment and housing all working as one. And I really think the, uh, the, you know, the good kind of capstone that you put on the Tualatin 2040 project and leading into uh, your council advance and what uh, direction that does in, in 2020 uh, is, a, is that, is looking at these issues in a, in a more holistic way. So I think that's an excellent step there. Um, you heard this at both meetings, but definitely uh, more so in uh, West Lynn where they see as like as 205 gets backed up and, and people get gummed up into their community, the, the impacts about tolling. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, ODOT just hired uh, their project manager for the tolling project just this past week. And so um, I've just been invited to like the first internal staff meeting. So I'll, I, I'd like to get somebody from ODOT here uh, to give a presentation on that sometime in the spring. So once, once different committees and things get uh, rolling there. Um, and that growth is gonna continue. And so how do, we, how do we react to that? How do we incorporate it was kind of a common theme. And so, uh, yeah, again, just kind of providing this opportunity. Was there something that struck you in these things? Uh, are there certain projects or ideas that we as staff can get information from you on or, or work towards? Um, Want to provide that opportunity tonight? And you might have to prep for this. But I don't know, are, are you all aware about ODOT creating what they're calling the Mega Projects Office? Do you all know about it? Do you, can you give them a little primer yeah. on this new office that was developed at ODOT? <laughs> sure, I think, and I don't know all the kind of internal detail, pieces, yeah, but basically uh, projects over like um, X number of $100 million. And so like the, uh, if you've seen in the news, the Rose Quarter study up in Portland, uh, the I-205 widening and investment there, the, uh, the bridge that would connect Portland over there into Washington. And they have say, so they have this like division now that just works on these very political mega projects within ODOT, um, and so they have a, I believe they have like a director there, they have an equity official, and then they have this uh, for the tolling study itself, they have a program manager um, just for that program. And I believe they report to the head of ODOT, right? Not to I the region. So, yeah, just They're directly on the on same that team. line on the org chart as the regions. So mm -hmm. just so you know. They call it the Mega Projects yeah. Office. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so I'm 
Mm -hmm. There's, there's sure. also at the um, both at the R1, the last R1 meeting, and, and someplace else. I think it might have been the Clackamas County Coordinating Committee last month. Um, ODOT's also now starting up a uh, project of under 25 million, and they have a tier one, which includes additional lanes in Wilsonville on the I-5. Um, they are betting heavily on selling the legislature on funding the program because of how well the extended lanes worked on I-5. Um, the, the one they put up was, it's kind of laughable. If you tra travel between I-5, the 217 and, and the 205, the uh, wait time on their list went from six hours to zero, which they acknowledged it's, it's not, but they said the way that the data comes out, they were <laughs> able, he said, for now, to say zero, and they're, that's what they're using. Yeah. Um, but I believe it's 37 projects in the metro area that they're planning on uh, 217 um, auxiliary lanes, um, improving the, uh, the ramp from the 205 westbound to the I northbound. Um, as everyone I'm sure is aware, there was a, a teenager killed there two years ago in a really bad accident. And they're aware of, the, I mean, they're aware of the safety issues there. And so they're, that's on the list. That's one of the tier one projects. So they are finally, I, I, I'm excited because from where I sit, it seems like based on everything I've heard that TriMet is finally listening and ODOT is finally listening and beginning to take some steps to that a lot of us have been asking for. And actually, I'd add one more thing about the bus on lanes, uh, bus on shoulder time. Um, Commissioner Paul Savas and several others um, were very instrumental in getting in the design work for the 205 for that extra lane and the bridge to make sure it included a, uh, the ability for bus on shoulder. And ODOT, I got to tell you, ODOT fought them the whole way until they finally said, oh yeah, this is a great idea. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot going, as you said, there is a lot going on and, and it's um, fun times. Yep. Well, and I'll just say with, with Councilor Morrison, definitely you're following the R1 Act is going to be, you, know, you stay pretty engaged there and that's going to be a key committee in reviewing the tolling piece of it. Because it's a state project, the R1 Region 1 Area Commission on Transportation is ODOT's real like public facing uh, forum for that. Did you got something? Are we on to the list of green and yellow projects as well? <laughs> Open mic? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's up to you. <laughs> well, I just wanted to ask, uh, on the first last mile transportation site that Washington County is doing, is there any preliminary conclusions out about what can be done to have greater accessibility to the West Station? Sure. Uh, that should be, uh, that got delayed from being published, but within the next month. They'll, they'll produce their um, final results. The downtown, our downtown West Station was selected as one of 10 transit stations in the county where they did a more intensive study on kind of what could it take with new technology and mobility and all this. And so uh, when that's put out, I'll make sure it's communicated. Okay, and, and one of the things we've been doing around town that I've gotten great reviews about are those rapid flashing beacons, mm -hmm. because, especially with the bad weather and the dark. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I see people all the time scrambling across from the West Station, uh, going east across Boone's Ferry. Uh, and so we may want to consider, you know, whether it's these dollars or our dollars or a combination of them, looking at that and other intersections downtown. I know uh, Upper Boone's Ferry uh, has also been an area of concern. So uh, thanks for that. The second question is on the uh, UGB Reserves Infrastructure Study mm -hmm. for Washington County. I got the website uh, and the map on that. Is that something we're engaged in at the staff level, or is that? Uh, yeah, um, our planning manager, Steve Coper, okay. is engaged in that. All right, I'll speak with him. They have a neat name, Ernst, or something like that. Well, I think it's, a, that. it's an important study, as, as you know, we yeah. look at the limited areas uh, that are urban reserves in Washington County. We have one of the largest ones. Uh, and you know, while it's not on you know, task for development anytime soon, uh, the more we can be involved with that study and thinking forward about, you know, what kind of infrastructure mm -hmm. is going to be needed out there, mm -hmm. uh, the more we can get the experts to look at it and give us an opinion on how things might develop out that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. You know where to find us. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. See you All in right. the morning. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up, uh, we have Library Services and Funding, Jerry Ann. Welcome. Hello. Can 
control L. Thanks, Bates. <laughs> Bingo. No. Bingo. Control L. Yeah. <laughs> He jinxed you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Jerry Ann Thompson. I'm the library director. Okay. So tonight I'm here to share with you information about the library's programs and services and to give you an overview of the library's funding, which is different from most other city departments. Uh, Tualatin Library's mission is to empower and engage our community through learning, discovery, and interaction. The library is an important part of the fabric of our community. We're a member of the Washington County Cooperative Library Services, or WCCLS, which is a network of 16 public libraries. Washington and Clackamas County residents can use their WCCLS library card at any of those libraries to check out items. Interaction is about being a living space for library users. The Tualatin Library is one of the city's vibrant and accessible gathering places celebrating our whole community. Open 65 hours per week and 359 days per year, we serve as the community's living room. Public libraries of today are one of the few non-commercial community spaces open to all. We expand access to learning opportunities and social connections. We bring people together. We have about 21,000 visits each month. People come to the library for social activities, including hanging out in the teen room, playing with Legos in the children's room, or joining neighbors to watch a cultural performance in front of our fireplace. We give space for our residents to gather for study groups and for meetings. In a recent survey, 95% of respondents said that Tualatin Library is a welcoming place. One of the ways that we bring people together is through programs. The library hosts about 700 programs every year. Mostly are free to attend, to offer learning and cultural opportunities for all ages. And programs for children and families is a priority area for us. Our children's programs are led by Sam Wickstrom and Lauren Simon. They present six story times each week to offer literacy building skills for little ones and their parents. At our story times, librarians don't just read books to kids. They help parents learn how to interact with children in ways that support reading development. Parents have reported to us that attending story time helps them feel more prepared to help their children learn how to read. We offer after school programs focused on STEAM. Say it with me. Science, Science technology, technology, engineering, arts, and math. math. All right. Sam and Lauren also make regular visits to local schools, preschools, and Head Start classes, and <coughs> conduct other outreach. For example, each month, Lauren brings activities to Spanish-speaking families who live in Terrace View apartments. One of the library's most significant activities to support literacy is our summer reading program. Summer reading is designed to help children maintain their reading skills over the summer break while also having fun. Summer reading is a family affair as we encourage readers of all ages to participate. In the summer, the library also serves as a free lunch site, and library staff bring summer reading and hands-on activities to kids at Etfolity Park. The library's teen room is a popular place for after school and, um, and hanging out during breaks, thanks to teen librarian Amy Michael. We offer a weekly movie night, video games on the weekends, and after school and summer programming. Our teen library committee is a very active group, helping to plan and present programs for children and for teens, and giving the teen perspective on library services. Amy also does regular outreach, including leading book clubs at Hazelbrook and Tualatin High. For adults, our programs include expert-led workshops and personal growth classes. Through our programs, which are coordinated by Julie Wickman, Adults have developed skills to improve their employment opportunities and have prepared to become U.S. citizens. We rely heavily on partnerships to deliver our adult programs. For example, we regularly offer classes by PCC. We've hosted several presenters through the Oregon Humanities Conversations Project. We've had job fairs and a repair fair, and we also host local bands playing monthly performances at the fireplace. 
While all of our children and teen programs are free, we do charge cost recovery fees on some adult programs. In addition to all of these programs, Tualatin Library continues to offer traditional library services. This includes making book recommendations, answering reference questions, and providing interlibrary loan services. Through the library's collection of 105,000 items, patrons can find a wide range of materials to delight and entertain, to inspire or to feed their learning. Every year we buy the most popular titles and topics, as well as materials to support homework, personal enrichment, and lifelong learning. Our collection is responsive to public demand, and we offer materials in English and in Spanish. Our collection is bolstered by the 1.7 million items available through our membership in WCCLS, and that includes books, movies, and eBooks. One of the newest additions to our library collection is the Library of Things. Patrons can check out equipment including a sewing machine, a telescope, a drill set, a voltage tester, a ukulele, or a pickleball set. It's a great way to try out a piece of equipment before you buy, or to borrow something that you need to use just for a limited amount of time. We're still building this collection, so if there are things that you would like to borrow, please let us know. The library is an access point for technology. Sitting here with all this technology around in front of us, it's easy to think that everyone is as connected as we are, but that's just not the truth. There are still people in our community that do not have the means to own a computer or the skills to effectively use the internet. People without equitable access to technology are not on a level playing field when it comes to jobs or accessing social and government services. That's why we offer computers, laptops, Chromebooks, and e-readers uh, at the library, as well as Wi-Fi and printing. Library staff provide basic instruction on how to use various devices, such as showing someone how to access e-books on, on their telephone. We offer more in-depth one-on-one technology help through volunteer tech tutors. We also have a variety of makerspace equipment available, including 3D printers and vinyl cutters, which we make available through programs. The library is also a virtual space where individuals can gain access to resources. Thanks to WCCLS, library patrons can download eBooks, stream movies, take software classes, improve their job skills, and access research information in databases 24-7. Tualatin Library is also a place for service. We offer opportunities for families to volunteer together, provide work experience for teens, and host corporate and community groups. Combined, volunteers the, contribute the equivalent number of hours of three full-time employees, freeing up library staff to do higher level tasks. In addition to helping us check in and shelf library materials, volunteers fill a variety of roles. Some volunteers enable the library to expand our programs and services. For example, we have a volunteer who enables us to provide notary services at the library. We also have volunteers who prevent, present our American Sign Language class and origami classes. <laughs> Partnerships are essential to the library's success helping us to expand our program offerings and supporting use of the collection. Our partners include PCC, Legacy Meridian Park, TTSD, SOAR Immigration Services, the Historical Society, and the Ice Age Floods Institute. In addition to the help that we receive from volunteers and partners, we're fortunate to have two nonprofit organizations that support the library, the Friends of the Tualatin Library and the Tualatin Library Foundation. The Friends raise money through used book sales to support library programs, and the Library Foundation is committed to building an endowment for the library's future. They will help with fundraising for the proposed makerspace in the library, and they also support childhood literacy projects such as 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten. The biggest asset of our library is definitely our staff. It takes people to provide those services, to plan and deliver library programs, and to buy materials for the library's collection. More than that, though, our employees provide a personal touch. They are customer service experts who take time to engage with patrons as they provide assistance. They are information professionals 
who connect people with community resources, activities, and recommended reads. On a recent survey, 96% rated customer service at the library as good to excellent. We employ 21 full-time and part-time staff supplemented by temporary employees who work in an on-call basis. Combined, this totals 23.75 full-time equivalent employees. So, how do we fund all of these things that we're doing at the library? The library's budget is $2.42 million. Of course, personnel costs make up the majority of our expenses. As I said, it takes people to manage library's collections, to plan and deliver programs, and to provide direct service to our patrons. Personnel costs account for 82% of our budget. About 10% of our budget goes to, to pay for uh, materials for the library's collection, which is a very healthy amount. And programs account for 2% of our budget. These are our funding sources. 70% of our funding comes from Washington County Cooperative Library Services. The money we receive from WCCLS comes from two sources, the Washington County General Fund and the local option levy. The City of Tualatin General Fund contributes just under 25% of our budget. We also receive revenue from the Library District of Clackamas County, and our budget is supplemented by donations and grants. For example, annual donations from the Friends of the Library pay for about half of our library's program costs, which is what enables us to offer all those programs for free for kids and teens. The library levy comprises one-fourth, more than one-fourth, of our budgeted revenues. This local option operating levy is a five-year levy approved by voters in 2015. It expires in June 2021. The levy is at a rate of 22 cents per thousand of assessed property value. In addition to providing the majority of funding for WCCLS libraries, the levy funds also supported buying additional copies of high demand titles, implementation of automated materials handling equipment at the WCCLS courier, which serves all member libraries, and expanding online resources to include more ebooks, video streaming, and online homework help. Washington County plans to ask voters to renew the library levy at the current rate in the upcoming May 2020 election. Lisa Tattersall of WCCLS will be here at Council on March the 9th to talk to you about the upcoming library levy. And she'll be joined by Sheriff Pat Garrett, who will speak about the public safety levy, which will also be on that same ballot. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about library services or library funding. Questions, comments? Bridget. Thank you. Uh, we enjoy the library my household. And um, you didn't mention music. Music is a big one, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we were just looking at the library of things. I was showing my husband that. So the pickleball, somebody had suggested playing pickleball. And I wasn't sure if I would be able to play that. So to see the set there, right. I thought that was so great. So, yeah. um, and I had a question about there's an upcoming program, and I wanted just to bring it up to around um, Martin Luther King Day. Yes. And um, could you share a little bit about that one? Yes, it's a program It's going to be held on the 15th um, in honor of Martin Luther King Day. It's, um, it's a project that's supported. Um, it's, it's being held here at the Tualatin Library and also at the Tigard Library. And the idea is to bring people together to talk about to talk about our community's issues, just in, in recognition of Martin Luther King's. Yeah, and I think it's called Bridging the Divide. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I, um, I was just curious more about that. Um, so it's gonna be like a discussion group? Or? They're gonna be speakers, and then there will be facilitated discussion groups as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, Paul? So first, first off, and I, I've, I've said this many, many times, but I, I think it bears repeating. Thank you so much for everything you do for the city library. My, uh, my mother was a high school librarian uh, in the El Rancho School District for forever. <laughs> and so that's kind of what I grew up with in a library environment. And I think what you're doing with the, your staff in particular, um, incredibly um, outgoing, 
helpful. Um, you know, again, the words can't describe it, but it just continually bears repeating because of the excellent job you're doing. So my question on the library levy is who in particular is actually running that campaign and how can we, the council, I know staff can't get involved, but how can the council get involved? And for example, council members, you remember for the transportation bond, we endorsed as a council. We had, we had problems getting it on the Washington County ballot pamphlet because they are way stricter than Clackamas County, but we've learned and we, we know now how to get everybody's name on there if, if they're so inclined to, to participate. But um, who do you have that information yet? Because the deadline is, as we know from our foray into parks and bonds, the deadline is fast approaching. Mm -hmm. um, in previous levy elections, the council has passed a resolution expressing support of okay. endorsing the levy. So that is an option that you guys can certainly pursue. Um, the, as you said, public employees can't campaign, so we will provide information about the levy um, through the, throughout all the libraries. Uh, there is also a political action committee called People for Libraries that supports the library levy. Okay, but do you, is there somebody in charge that you know of, or is it just... I can get you information about that. I don't, I don't remember the name off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, and the, the main reason is we had... Um, we had what was a resolution for the transportation bond and Washington County wouldn't accept it. They wanted signatures from each counselor or they wanted it published in a newspaper and then they wanted us to reference the newspaper article. Mm. I, don't ask me. Clackamas County was like, yeah, you got the minutes of your meeting and you got the resolution, we're all good. And they, they published, you know, it was supported by the Tualatin City Council. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, to me anyway, I think stuff like that's important. I, I know a lot of people do read the ballot summary and they look at it. And the, the more names we can have in there, um, you know, the more support that we have from the entire Washington County, then the, the you know, the better sell it is. Although, mm -hmm. personally, I think it's an easy sell, but you can't take your foot off the neck. Can't, we can't take it for granted, that's no, for sure. No, you cannot. <laughs> no. So we can certainly get you the information about the people for libraries, but um, it might be worth one of you reaching out to Chair Harrington or somebody that you know on the, the Board of Commissioners because they're, they're elected as well and I, are fully supportive of, of this, and I would presume that they would know how to make those connections and guide you. Okay. Other questions, comments? I just want to thank you, Jerry, and your staff. Again, like Paul was saying, it's terrific staff. As Bridget was saying, I was in there last week, walked through the, you know, the counters, little glass security things, whatever you want to call those. You know, big smiles on both sides from staff members saying, you know, good evening, very welcoming um, library. One thing that irritated me, it's not you, is I was at Denny Doyle's State of the City. And he claimed that Beaverton was the number one library in the state well. of Oregon. I'm like, by what measure? <laughs> <laughs> so your goal for 2020 is to beat out Beaverton. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're pretty proud of their library. But, uh, you know, um, we have a terrific library also. You know, it's smaller, but I think it's just as good as theirs. Theirs you can get lost in and, you, you know, there's no staff member to help you. But here That's we right. have that. Yes. But thank you for everything you do. Absolutely. Okay. I'll be, I'll be glad to share that with library staff. Okay. Valerie? I was just interested why they're keeping it at the same rate instead of increasing it to kind of adapt to inflation over those years. The, the, the current levy was an increase over the previous. Um, so I think that was, yeah. So, so there has been an increase within the last five years. Robert? How long is the levy? Four. It's a five-year levy. Okay. So um, this one would run 2021 through 2026. Anything else? Nancy? Just an anecdotal look at what I think is like what is so successful about our library in part is I think the way that it interacts with the community from, you know, small children all the way up. Because I know in our family, we spent a lot of time at the library when Emily was little and did a lot of things, but we continue to use the library now. My parents enjoy it, and the library even kept Emily's attention like through her teen years, and she did the summer volunteer program, mm -hmm. and she loved it. I mean, she like burned through the number of um, volunteer hours 
that she could do so quickly because she just loved the people that were in charge of the teen program and the teen volunteer program. And I just think that's a huge compliment because, you know, it's at different phases of a family's life, it's easy to get like the little mm-hmm. kids and that type of thing, but to be able to keep the, the focus and the interest as a lifelong learner, I just think that that's terrific. And I just, for a center and a heart for our community, I just think our library is just absolutely outstanding. So thank you. Yeah, it's a huge part of our family life and I couldn't be more proud of what you guys do in the community. Thank you for sharing that. Outstanding. That just, Nancy just triggered something in my head. And I want to, uh, you mentioned the 1.7 million uh, items on mm-hmm. circulation in the Washington County Cooperative Library Services. I think that the library has access to, uh, Donna had a need for a business book that wasn't in the county system. They can get books from local colleges and universities, and that's, she went to a re- reference librarian, mm-hmm. and a few days later, there it was. And that's so, also a free service. That's yeah, a free mm-hmm. service that you don't know, you can get access to university libraries. So that's a terrific service that people yeah. don't know about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're up to item number three, uh, council agenda reviewed. Anyone have uh, any questions on the consent agenda or anything on tonight's meeting? The, c- the city council meeting, not the, I guess you also have any questions on the uh, TDC meeting? That's going to be following our council meeting. <laughs> All right. Uh, it was so long ago, who did the pledge last? Uh, I think I did. You did? So you're up, Bridget? Okay. All right. All right. And then, uh, is there anything else we have to cover? There's no proclamations. Pretty, okay. I guess it's down to council communications. We'll start with Paul. So. So just a couple um, of things real quick. I attended the Clackamas County Business <laughs> Alliance uh, annual legislative update days last week. Um, I believe Councillor um, Trot was there too, correct? Yeah. Um, the, the main center of questions was about transportation and about funding for, uh, in particular, uh, Clackamas County um, Community College. Um, but the, the transportation is what was really driving that whole um, group and it was it was very well attended. Um, they have uh, well represented by a number of Clackamas County state representatives and uh, a couple of uh, state senators. So it was very interesting. It's the same theme as our town hall that Rachel Pusek had here um, in December. I mean, it's the same questions from just from different people. Um, and the other thing is on January 23rd at um, Tawallison High School. Uh, Representative Rachel Prezak and Representative Andrea Salinas are hosting, along with State Senator Rob Rag- Wagner, e- e-cigarette epidemic, the vaping crisis among our youth. Also involved in the presentation and the community dialogue is Talton Together, um, the high school group Stand Up, Tiger Turns the Tide, the Tiger High School group Stud, Clackamas County and Washington County Public Health, um, the Oregon Health Authority, and I probably missed somebody. It has been uh, in the works now for a couple of months, um, and it uh, should be a very good dialogue about um, not only about the, the vaping issues within not only within our community, but then um, Rachel Pusak in particular is has two bills that she's introducing in this short session that will be dealing with vaping, as well as Washington County has really taken the lead on following what Multnomah County did. Um, three years ago and creating a retail licensing program for cigarette vendors and uh, and charging them a fee um, so that the program pays for itself. And so um, if you uh, are free that night, uh, coming down, it's at 6.30 at uh, Twalton Hills High School. And that's all I have. Valerie? Um, Yeah, I went to the... um, Clackamas County legislative update and the one thing I got out of it that I thought really affected us is that the um, I think it's the state representatives they've formed a group where they um, talk together and try to come up with common issues that they can kind of band together and their big one was the Abernathy Bridge and getting funding for that so I thought that was something that directly affects us um, I went to the policy advisory board for Washington County Community Block Grant meeting as a sub for um, Bridget, and um, mostly they went through their um, 
the the rating criteria for the people that have applied for grants. Um, the only one I saw with the name Twelton and it was that Love Inc. group, which is that church organization that helps people with special needs. They band together. They put in for thirty thousand dollars so they can get extra, have extra hours to be open for people. Um, they also had um, part of the. Um, they have a fair housing analysis report they did. And they went through the impediments and. Um, so Washington County, since 1990, used to was 90% um, white population, and now it's 70%, which is you know quite a change. But the one thing that was kind of interesting and I thought kind of sad is that even though our diversity has increased, it, our population still segregated by you know mm -hmm. our backgrounds. Um, then I went to the um, as a sub to the Metro Area Communications Commissioners meeting. Um, Frontier, now they're saying they're looking at the end of March, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, I found all these um, communications people are very vague in <laughs> their uh, <laughs> statements. <laughs> um, they did have for Maria an answer, though, on the payments for customers as the company switches, that the people that are um, ACH, they will be sent um, something, but they will need to contact their bank somehow and change who the payment's going to, so they will have to go through that process. People on credit cards, they will it will continue, so that people that use credit cards for payments, it'll just be a different name on their credit card statement. And then people that go online, they will have to go but um, to a new place, but they're gonna send a link to people. So hopefully these communications will be clear, especially to people with the ACH payment process. Um, there's also, um, I thought it was really interesting, they were talking about these um, with 5G coming and the FCC kind of pushing on the communities of what they're requiring and it sounded like Westland and Wilsonville had um, some pretty interesting ideas to kind of fight back a little and um, they might talk about that at the next meeting which would be really useful and then um, I think that's all I have for today. Um, well, Happy New Year, guys, and um, I will say that I couldn't make the arts advisory meeting. I was on vacation the same week as that one in December. Um, however, what they did do was combine with the Parks Committee and talk about ideas around the Veterans Memorial Park. So. Um, that's where we are with that committee. So I do know what's going on, even though I wasn't there. I really <laughs> wanted to be there. Um, and I don't know what else I did in December, but I was, I'm going to just start fresh with the new year. We did, I met also with Valerie and Maria for the CACA um, it, it, uh, committee, and we helped appoint several. Um, committee members for local volunteers. So I just want to say again for everybody that applies, um, because we can't always select everybody, but everybody's interest is really valued, <coughs> welcomed, and wanted. And there are a lot of opportunities. We talked about volunteer opportunities at the library and other ways that people can get involved um, while they're um, waiting for sort of the perfect spot on um, committee. Most of the committees we looked at were budget committee appointments, but there was also a parking district. Uh, yeah, the core parking district um, that we were able to help fill. And, um, and then finally, I went to a PAB meeting too this month, and we, um, it was one of the more dense meetings that I've been to since I've started on that committee. We um, went over uh, the Fair Housing Council's report on pairs testing, which is when two different renters go to rent the same um, place and one is um, a protected class, which falls into four different categories. So there's race, ethnicity, disability, and income source. And the biggest um, disparity actually for people for different answers like oh there's less apartments available to you there's a longer waiting list for you those kinds of um, 
things were, were with income source, which I don't think a lot of people, even landlords, smaller landlords, might not know that we have paid, passed a state law around discrimination around income source. So this focuses mainly on a lot of people that get vouchers. So, so if you're going to get a voucher, well, first you're in a tough spot, and then there's a big, long waiting list for a voucher. Um, and then people, when they go into rent, are dealing with pushback from places that they want to rent to, rent from. So I'm not saying everybody, but it's an area that not only tenants need education on, but also landlords need education on, that we have this law, that it's illegal to do that, um, and that when people have vouchers, they're on different time constraints as well. So if they don't rent during a specific time, they can lose their voucher. So they can be waiting and waiting for a voucher, and then they can lose their voucher depending on what happens. And I also just want to think, just as a social worker, to invite people to think about who gets vouchers. So it's not only people that have you know been sick, have trouble with work, a lot of women and children and um, and then when you look at there's there was disparity in every one of those protected classes. So ethnicity, disability, which a lot of people think is just, oh, maybe they need to make counters or things like that. But there are many people that have disabilities that are in mental health. So there wouldn't be any accommodations like that. Um, and they were not identified what kind of disability this was just that they got SSI or SSD. So, um, you know, when we're talking about different, even plastic, even the bag thing or tolling or housing, how deep um, it's felt from certain people in our communities on very limited incomes. I think it's for many of us, it can be very difficult to imagine what that looks like and um, this housing crisis that we're in the middle of um, shows up in these, when you really start thinking about it, shows up in these very people with lives that are in very vulnerable places. So, um, so that was one aspect of the meeting. There was an analysis of impediments um, from some of this testing results, and there was solutions which were focused mainly on funding, more education, as well as better enforcement because our enforcement arm has basically, there was a state agency that was doing HUD enforcing and they stopped doing it. So there's a renewed interest in having that, our state agency pick that back up again. So, and there's new leadership in, the, um, in that. So it looks like that is, may happen. Um, and then we are getting ready for doing the, there was also um, the Metro Bond Evaluation Committee, there's an opening, and then there was um, a Zoom grants review since we're ready to be doing the reviews for, for the grants. And there's a, um, a more formalized calendar. So if anyone's curious on council about when we're doing all the things that's in February and things like that, you can just come talk to me. Um, but I'll be there through the process. And um, I think that's it. No, I know how to use Zoom grants, which is pretty easy. Um, I will say that that committee is very well organized, very informative, and is working hard in Washington County to try to make changes happen for people with what they can do. So um, it's such a huge, immense issue that we have in our communities and um, in it's the approach that they're taking there is a multi-pronged approach, but I will say there's no perfect solution either. So. Um, that's all I've got. <laughs> okay. Robert. 
Uh, not a great deal. Um, I spent a lot of my Christmas break with professional obligations, uh, but because there are still a few minutes of my day that are undesignated, uh, I have decided to join uh, the League of Oregon Cities Policy Committee on Transportation uh, and also the one on Telecommunications and Broadband. So uh, for those folks who are interested in those debates, uh, look forward to your input on those and I will share uh, what I learn at those committees as well as ideas for, for future legislation. Uh, I did find time for a couple of meetings with the folks from the Hamlet, a couple of people from Borland, and so that process continues to evolve. Uh, we're also going to loop in uh, some of the CIO folks in CIO2 that are part of East Waltz and that are very interested. Uh, and again, there's no developments that are, we're rushing through. It's all just possibilities and potential at this point. Um, but again, I want to remind everybody that, you know, as Mayor Bubenick and we all agreed up there, as we're all speaking from the same uh, sheet and to share that information as these things evolve, we're hoping that at some point uh, in the first half of 2020 uh, that we'll get this areas of interest discussion started with, with Ernest uh, and start to make some progress on getting the transportation uh, and deeper level study done uh, out in the Stafford area. So that's all I have for now. Okay. Maria? Yeah, it was uh, also pretty quiet um, time, some you know, the time off that we had. Um, I did go to the, um, the, oh my gosh, I just totally forgot the name of it. Um, it, was, uh, it was from the Diversity Task Force on Decem in December, uh, Posada. And it was uh, fairly nice. Um, I learned a lot from, you know, I, I never done it before, so it was an interesting event. Um, hopefully next year you can all join. Um, then that it was it was a pretty pretty quiet December. So thank you. Um, just to dovetail into what um, Robert was talking about, the East Walton CIO um, is um, very interested in coming alive and full of questions about the Borland um, Stafford area. Um, discussions and development and planning and areas of interest and all of those things um, with from their perspective you know heavy emphasis emphasis on timing and traffic and those sorts of implications and um, I think it might be nice to try to set up a meeting with some of the key people in the East Walton CIO Charlie and some other um, really active members and try to sort of integrate them into the knowledge about what the meetings that are taking place and the discussions and the planning. I think that would be a nice thing to do if we could do that in the near future. So um, that's about, that's what I have. Okay. That's where I am at this point. All right. Um, I ended the year up with the Posada at Bridgeport Elementary School, which was packed. I mean, it was great to see so many community members there. Uh, school board members were there, kids running around, Robert's daughter were singing. Uh, great event. Look forward to that next year. I just got to be prepared for a whole bunch of elementary school kids running around having a great time. <laughs> the level of the volume was incredible, but people really enjoyed it. It was fun. Uh, the meetings have not ended <laughs> for me. They just keep going. Um, the MMC, the Metro Mayor's uh, Consortium, we had a meeting and uh, highlights of that is that uh, PG presented fairly quickly about what they're calling structural parity. Um, there are new wholesale power providers in the area that are providing power to larger industries and bypassing the right of way fees they're just supposed to be paying to cities um, because it's not coming via PGE. So PG was basically saying, you know, keep an eye out on development in your community. If you see your, uh, your right of way fees go down from PGE, there might be a reason for that, um, that you might want to talk to people or, um, cause it, they had a horror story in Hillsboro where theirs was down by $5 million <laughs> and they had a budget hole they had to fill. Uh, but Don and Sherilyn are on it. They're aware of it. Um, Don has been looking out to the community, make sure people are paying, you know, those guys, <laughs> I guess if you you know you open up a new company that has a certain level of power consumption, you can um, from day one 
select to get your, so your electricity from a different source than PGE, or every September you can decide to change your power provider. There's, there's a window. So I didn't know that. It was kind of cool. Uh, second thing was uh, for the 2000, for the short session here, the mayors are concerned with uh, community mental health funding. We're going to beat up on the legislature about getting some more funding for mental health in our cities. Um, the Rose Quarter, that thing has fallen apart. And we're delighted, well, I shouldn't say delighted, we will gladly take that money and put towards I-205. <laughs> They're not going to give it up, but we will be happy to take it. Um, uh, pretty much you all know it's going to be all carbon all the time on the short session and see what happens with that. And then uh, prevailing wage in enterprise zones is a big discussion. We don't, I don't believe we have an enterprise zone, but it's a big concern in Hillsborough and Beaverton where they do have enterprise zones about having to pay a uh, prevailing wage. Um, long story short there, uh, that kind of got beat back, that prevailing wage does not have to be paid in enterprise zones right now, but it'll probably come back in 2021. Um, as far as the legislative session, you know, it starts in February. Uh, you gotta move your bill in the first 10 days. If it doesn't move, it's dead. So you only have 10 days to get it done. Uh, legislative days started today. So they were trying to get their act together for um, the session. And last thing is, uh, you know we're part of Greater Portland, Inc. is the economic development agency that's in the region. We're part of the small cities uh, part of it. There's a movement afoot to merge, possibly merge Greater Portland, Inc. with the Portland Business Alliance. And that went over like a <laughs> lead balloon with the mayors um, that they don't think it's at to our advantage to be partnered up with the Portland Business Association or the Business Alliance, but they're trying to save money at GPI somehow. Um, they're going to be presenting it to their board fairly shortly. Um, pretty much all the mayors except one were against it. So we'll see what happens with that because we feeling this is that, you know, the Portland Business Alliance is only going to care about Portland, <laughs> not the region like GPI does. Um, we then skip over that. That's boring. <laughs> uh, Beaverton State of the City uh, was on the ninth. Uh, Denny did a terrific job. What's interesting there is their Performing Arts Center is 97% funded. Yeah, so they're going to be able to build this thing pretty soon, and they they're pretty excited. Contributions. Yep, all uh, as Pat Reeser wrote a big fat check. That helps too. <laughs> Hence the name. <laughs> Yeah, lodging tax. They're putting a whole bunch of stuff together, but they're pretty darn close. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, I saw I saw the mayor's morning. I saw my wife last week. Uh, so the, the, another meeting of the mayors was at the Beaverton Mayor's Lunch. Uh, what was interesting there was uh, the Willamette Water Supply Project, how that's proceeding. You know, it's the big pipe from the Willamette heading up to Hillsboro. Um, the frustration, I shouldn't say frustration, their t the planning is the challenge there because they don't want to dig up roads more than once. So they're trying to coordinate as roads are dug up, you know, from here. I mean, they did ours uh, when 124th was done, but the timing on Roy Rogers Road and then Boone's Ferry Road, I'm sorry, on uh, Tualatin and Sherwood Road. Um, so they're trying to get that together. And so it's all bits and pieces to get that, those pipes all the way up to Hillsborough and the planning of it is driving them crazy, but it's, it's happening. Um, then Youth Villages of Oregon uh, presented, and these are the folks who help, um, rather than have kids go to foster care, they try to help the family stay together and give them the parents the skills they need for a kid who's at risk. Uh, it was an interesting presentation that their first priority is for in-house assistance of keeping the kids at home and giving the parents the skills they need. Uh, any kid that shows up in Providence or St. Vincent, uh, an emergency room with similar, you know, assault or something like that, they're dispatched out uh, as a social service agency. And a big thing that I was not aware of is the crisis that Oregon's having with youth aging out of foster care. There's nothing at the state level for these kids. You hit 21, you're on your own. Eight, well, they have something for, it starts at 16, but 21, they're officially out, according to them. Uh, so they're, what they're trying to do is give those kids, they started 16, trying to give them the life skills that they're going to need because that's it. Moving on. Youth Villages. 
It's Youth Villages, Oregon. Next thing is this morning, the Washington County Coordinating Committee. Um, it was interesting. Um, Paul was there. It was like testy mayor day. Uh, Metro. Oh, I, um, no, the presenter. I felt sorry for the woman, uh, Carrie Stacy. So Metro's putting something together called the Metro Regional Barometer, and it looks pretty cool. It's a consolidation of a whole bunch of data points and data libraries in a website so that you can get data about the different priorities of Metro, the six focus areas they have. So you can see the, the heat map of the area, the canopy, the economic diversity, all the stuff they're trying to consolidate into one website for the public. And that what's the key thing for me is then say there's a data uh, database they're using, you can pull it down and use it at your city. I asked if they have rolled this out to the cities yet, no. <laughs> They're only, they basically only rolled it out to a, uh, a couple of the mayor's conferences. It's going to be supposedly go live in March. Um, we asked that, I guess Metro used to have city manager meetings in the past. Yeah, quarterly. Yeah, they said maybe they, they convene one of these to roll this out to city managers so they can see that this tool is out there for people like Jonathan can use. Um, so she got kind of beat up because you can see there was a little bit of an anti-Metro sentiment this morning. And then the next gentleman, uh, Gordon Howard of Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, I felt sorry for him because he was just taking the bullets for the legislature <laughs> about HB 2001 and 2003 on what was their logic on why is the supply, what was the magic number of 1,000, why did it have to be a population of 1,000 above for the bill to apply to, and where did they pull 10,000 out of? Um, so he basically went over what the missing middle legislation is. They're going through rules right now. And developing the rules there's a lot of concern on uh, that cities are uh, represented well uh, Garrett is on one of the committees on especially on the infrastructure side of the rulemaking that they're aware of what's involved with developing communities and how long it takes years from to develop and the impact on infrastructure um, I my question in my head but I didn't bring it up is they picked we're considered a large city by the state anything over 25,000 people is we're a large city for HB 2001 and 2003. So you got a lot of um, rules that will be coming down. I guess they have 10 more meetings, they said, to, to decide these rules. There's 10 meetings, have 8 meetings. Yeah, and they got to get this done because they're supposed to be done with their job by the end of this year with the rules template for a planning template. So this is in uh, motion. Uh, next meeting. <laughs> The Aging Task Force I went to this afternoon. Um, Ed Casey and Del Potts are starting the Washington County Aging Place Committee. Uh, Ed Casey and Del Potts went on behalf of the Aging Task Force to see what's going on there. They're launching a, a, an effort in Washington County for you know, consulting resources about house sharing, uh, lifelong housing. Um, they don't know if they're gonna go again, but we'll see next month, because uh, they're both pretty busy and it's hour long meetings. But I think Susan will find someone to attend those meetings. Uh, ARP was there today talking about age-friendly communities. Um, seven Oregon cities are aged, certified as age-friendly cities, and it's something I've been looking into and see maybe we can try to get them to, uh, involved with, but see what the resources involved are. Uh, Sisters and Salem are two, uh, two cities that are age-friendly. And you go through the process. My concern was uh, staff capacity. But when you're developing this plan, ARP will give you a staff person to help you build your plan. Uh, and then Joe and Dale Potts discussed the Veterans Memorial Task Force that starts meeting on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be part of that committee uh, to start planning the Veterans Memorial. And JPAC meets on the 16th. Um, Mayor Doyle was saying that what might be of interest for the cities is the uh, update on transportation provi provisions of proposed state climate legislation. So I'll, I'll try to go to that. Um, big one he mentioned for February 20th meeting is the emergency transportation routes that they seem very Portland centric. Uh, basically the Burnside Bridge is the emergency route and they wanna hear more from Kim Ellis why when you have hospitals on both sides of the river, why does Burnside have to stay up? So it should be pretty good. Uh, anything else? Measure time. Uh, 23rd is going to be busy for Rachel and Rob because the 23rd, I believe, is the morning we're doing the 
transportation forum at the Chamber of Commerce, the breakfast meeting. <laughs> so I'll be attending that. We're going to basically, it's kind of the same thing Rachel did. Um, you saw the emails about the gun club and the noise of the gun club. Uh, Sherlin has arranged a meeting that I'll be attending with the gun, re gun club representatives to discuss the, the noise. And last thing, because we're falling behind, uh, NLC and DC registration is open right now. So if you're interested in going to DC, I already registered. Uh, it's March, around March 6th. Um, registration is open for the uh, Washington DC trip. I'm going from the 6th through the 12th, 11th, for basically a week. Because that one extra, yeah, that one extra day is when I can go and knock on the doors of Senator Wyden and Merkley and get them to yourself one-on-one -on -one versus the other 13 mayors. <laughs> so it's a good time. And uh, it's interesting you, what you can find out when you're just one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, that's it. All right. So, yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and conclude this meeting. We'll kick the next one up in uh, about five after seven.